you know, when I got you know, asked to do this, I was actually really excited, um, both because the people on this panel I consider really good friends and very thoughtful ambassadors of micro VC and emerging manager, but also it's something that I'm incredibly passionate about. So one of the things I do is really focus on working with the next generation of great VCs. And what we do at First Republic is help managers think about how to start, build, and scale their franchises, everything from fundraising to running a firm. And you know, one of the things that I've noticed consistently is a lot of what goes into starting and running a firm is very arcane. Um, and so what we'll try to do over the next 40, 40 to 45 minutes is really cover and deconstruct what it means to start a firm, run a firm, and what does the future look like. So I'm going to introduce uh, my uh, fellow panelists here. I'm going to start with uh, Semel Shah. Semel is in a very unique position within the Silicon Valley market, both as a investor who started a, a fund called Haystack five years ago, raising four funds and also a venture investor at a very big firm in Lightspeed. Um, the other thing Semmel, I think, just does an amazingly good job on is providing content. So if you don't follow this guy on Twitter, you should. He uses it not only to help other managers and founders, but also to refine his strategy by welcoming feedback. So let's welcome Semmel. Next, I want to uh, invite uh, Sean Dempsey up to the stage. Sean actually is one of our veterans in the emerging manager market. So he started his first fund back in 2008, which is probably the worst time you could raise, and has raised uh, now four funds. And Sean's a, a great person uh, you know, to really uncover what did it really take to institutionalize, which we'll cover today. So let's welcome uh, Sean. And then last but not least, I want to invite Margot Doyle. So Margot has a very unique background. So currently she runs S-Cubed, which is a large multi-billion family office. She's the allocator, so she's the one with money. But before that, she was also on the direct side. And she's somebody that has worked within the emerging manager space by investing, by consulting at Cambridge, and then prior to that was actually a direct investor. So we're going to, you know, I'm going to say probably five minutes at the end, perhaps, to answer, you know, any questions you have. But I'm going to kick it off with a very macro question, and I'm going to provide a couple of stats here. So since 2012, we've seen 556 first-time funds. Right now, there's 261 first-time funds in market. I want to get a sense and maybe we'll start with Semmel and Sean, like what has been driving this and what is your perspective on the progression of this part of the market? Yeah, I, I can, uh, thanks for having me uh, everyone and thanks for coming. Um, my quick answer to that is uh, from a high level, you have two forces, well three, three forces driving this. You have um, proliferation of technology through the economy and all the cultural acceptance and infatuation with it, social network movie, Shark Tank culture, you know, yada, yada, yada. Uh, you have a lot of money from around the world that's being shifted because of other economies, the base under those economies are shifting. They may be shifting from natural resources or other means of production and looking for yield. And then the third driver you have is I think more micro to the venture industry, which is a lot of the larger funds are actually experiencing difficulty in transitioning out the current leadership into the new leadership and what the new managers are doing, the generational change that would have been happening with inside venture is now happening outside venture. Um, you could add to that like platforms like AngelList or Spearhead or Y Combinator or first round platform and other things like that underneath it. And I think all those three forces together form this kind of vortex that this is why we're in this moment today. Sean? Well, I think, <clears throat> I think that's well said. It is that confluence of, of things that's contributed, I think, to the explosion of not only investors, but it starts with the amount of companies and opportunities that are available to invest in. And uh, as, as Samil just mentioned, things like AngelList, and, and we haven't talked about 
software tools and platforms that make it easier to get a company going, but all the infrastructure around not only technically how to build a company, but accelerators and programs that help companies uh, with mentorship, with connections, uh, events like this to help educate folks on if they're looking to raise money, how do I do that? Uh, and so I think over the past 10 years, we've seen a confluence of all those things, again, both technically, but also more administratively or business-wise that uh, provide more and more information for people to make that leap, both founders that are leaving, say, bigger companies to start their own business, uh, or people that want to be on the investment side and want to start a seed fund or, or join a venture capital firm. So, so one of the things, I'm going to pass it to Margo in a second. I, I, I do want to get the LP perspective. Before I do that, I just want to, with a quick show of hands, who here is raising right now a fund? Okay. Um, how many of you are raising a fund one? Okay, fund two? What about a fund three? Okay, so we have the vast majority that are raising fund one and fund two. So when I started covering the emerging manager market, um, most of the funds were you know, in the zero to 50 range. I think that's still the case. In fact, 50% uh, of the funds that we see are between zero and 25. Margo, from your perspective, you've, you know, you've really followed this you know, at Cambridge, making decisions and helping you know, your, your uh, investors get into some of these names. How has your calculus changed? How do you now evaluate when you're looking at a sea of 700 managers, what is your perspective on where we are right now? Lots in that question. <laughs> um, so just talking about the fund size piece of it, I agree that I think it's a structural change. Historically, some of the people raising smaller funds might have been junior partners within a larger organization and kind of gotten their uh, apprenticeship um, stripes there. And so, the, the proliferation of them, I think, is occurring because that ability to seed and start a new fund uh, with sub $100 million is now widely accepted. Um, one other point I would add to the comments earlier as well is I think that there's capital flow coming into venture that's just seeking a home. So there were a lot of institutional investors that were afraid of venture, frankly. Historically, they thought that they could only invest in it if they invested in the top five firms. They evaluated the ability to get an allocation, figured it was impossible, and sort of never went there. And then, of course, as the returns have not only shown that you don't need to be in only those top five names, but that uh, this is an asset class that is not a binary, you're going to make the high returns you see or you're going to lose everything. Uh, more institutional capital is coming in. So you do have this flow of demand for it. Um, one of the pieces I think is really important for people in the smaller funds to do the honest evaluation is what is your place within the ecosystem? Why is your investment thesis, your network, your sourcing going to be differentiated than the other probably 25 to 30 managers who are coming that look very, very similar to you when they come across my doorstep. And so you have to look at your universe um, and think about your differentiation pieces and present that and make sure that um, you're, you're reinforcing that with almost every aspect of your organization. I was recently telling a GP, when I applied to business school, someone gave me the advice, Make sure that anybody picking up any piece of your documentation would get the story about you and kind of try to narrow it down to five things. And I think that's good advice for a GP as well. Think about the five core pieces about your organization that you would want anybody either seeing your one minute pitch, your 20 page pitch deck, or your PPM, or your LPA. Like everything should reinforce your Twitter feeds, et cetera. Everything should reinforce your positioning, your differentiation, and I, I'm hopeful that that real honest evaluation will perhaps winnow us away from a little bit too much of me tooism right now in that really small end of the venture market. And, and one of the things I do want to double click on at one point is, is differentiation. What does that actually mean? Uh, I hear it a lot. Um, and, and I think it is still misunderstood in terms of what it means to be differentiated. One of the things, though, I, I really want to you know, talk through is I have a lot of conversations with first-time managers, and a lot of them actually came from a non-investing background, i.e., 
operators, people that might have invested but not invested professionally, so angel investing. And you know, the question I always ask is, well, why do you actually want to start a firm? And more often than not, I don't know I get the greatest answer. It's more I want to help companies and I really enjoy it. But I want to maybe look at Semmel and Sean. So Sean, 2008, Maris Fund One. Semmel, Haystack Fund One in 2013. Both from different backgrounds, so you weren't at big firms at that point. Walk me through the decision framework that you had when you decided to launch a firm. Yeah, and then I'll, I'll react uh, to Margo's comment, which I think is a good one, about the pitch deck and what you're explaining to investors. And that was our very first mistake in 08, and I'll come back to that maybe. Um, I guess to answer the question, why did, why did we do this? And I say we, there are uh, two partners and I, uh, formed Maris in 08. We had worked together for about 10 years at Microsoft and at Google, uh, leading acquisitions and investments at both places. So we'd worked together a long time, and we had invested off those balance sheets for a long time. And so for us, in particular, it was about wanting to do that uh, for our own account. Uh, we felt like we knew how to be investors. We had never built a pure ROI track record, so that was a real challenge for us. We didn't work at another firm, so we couldn't come into those early LP discussions and say, here's our track record. We could have made one up through different investments and acquisitions, but it wasn't a, you know, a real ROI-based thing. It, wouldn't, it wasn't just our decision, of course. So we had uh, no real track record, and that was the biggest hurdle that we had. But we wanted to be fund managers. We, we felt like this was a career we wanted to be in, uh, and it's a long-term commitment we're prepared to make, but we felt like it would be something we'd personally enjoy uh, and allow us to be even closer to investing in small businesses where at a corporation you're a little bit, uh, a little bit removed from that, even though you are occasionally making those investments. So for us, we thought we really enjoy that, and we felt we had some skill set to go out and do it, and we had to, we had to prove that. Um, I'll mention briefly that the big mistake we initially made was the pitch deck itself. It was way too detailed and nuanced about the kinds of businesses we wanted to invest in. Uh, and we thought it was great, and it was great with our Google colleagues. It generated a good discussion. But we got into those LP meetings, and they said, I don't really care about the detail around these kinds of things. Tell me about how you're different. How are you going to compete? Uh, and uh, what is the machine that you're building? So I'm investing in this machine. Uh, and so help me understand how you're going to compete uh, in a repeatable way over time and how you're going to be different than what is out there today because I see all kinds of investment opportunities. Sure. I have a quick question on that. Did, did any of the three of you, <clears throat> excuse me, have um, angel investments that you had rolled in and did you put up your own capital to begin with, with Fund One? Uh, we had no angel, we had a couple angel investments here and there, but not that we talked about as a track record. Uh, fund one, we did commit some of our own capital, but frankly didn't have enough to have any kind of real fund. Uh, and we initially went after family offices, which maybe we'll talk about uh, some year a bit later. But that, that, I think, is a good place to start when you're raising fund one. Yeah, for me, I think for folks who have followed my writing, maybe this is uh, redundant, so I'll keep it short. Back in 2012, I had been um, working at a, a number of companies for years kind of moonlit as a consultant for a number of firms uh, who had been reading what I've been writing over the years. I thought that one of them would hire me, none of them hired me. And so what happened was is that uh, a couple friends got together, told me I should raise a small kind of starter fund really to build a track record. Um, and then I was lucky to get kind of venture partner gigs with other firms because I knew a lot of other VCs. Um, and so really the initial two funds were to like take the my kind of rap sheet, so to speak, and then turn that in for an investment role. That was like kind of how I started. And the funds were really small, and so what I ended up doing at that time, and it would be the advice I give to a lot of people, is like going to work at a firm, which I initially wanted to do, I think you get some good experience, even though it's maybe not as cool uh, for folks in the room, except that didn't work out for me, and so I went this way, but I went with a really small fund and what I see people doing is trying to raise kind of larger funds, and so that's where some of the problems come in. So one of the things you just mentioned is a starter fund, and, and, and that's actually something that we've seen with great prevalence. You know, you don't have a track record. Maybe you have an angel track record, but you've been an operator. You have a certain thesis, and you find the uh, institutional LPs are, are fairly chilly to that type of, uh, that type of fund. 
So as you think about it, so when you went from a very small fund and became institutional, what is that path? Like, what do you have to prove? Because if you raise a $5 million fund with the thought that you're gonna raise 25, 30, 40 in two years, you're not really, you don't have a lot of a track record, nothing that's actually demonstrable. So what do you do? Yeah, I don't know if it's something I'd recommend <laughs> wholesale for people to do. I think it's a, it's a pretty long process and so something else has to drive you to wanna do it for that long. Um, I think the, the way I would break up um, an answer to your question is, I think LPs have to feel like they get to know you over time, uh, and so that just takes time. And you may, like, assume there's one LP out there that you connect with, you may have to meet or talk to him or her twice a year for like three years at least to like have some rapport. So that that's just kind of like, you know, uh, piece number one. I think number two is like all of your quote house needs to be in order. So like you need to be able to produce price per share. What's your current ownership? What dilution hit did you take in that company? Have somebody else like produce documents for you that are like accounting grade. And like that was definitely most people don't start with that because uh, it's too messy. And then especially when you're in seed, you might have more companies. It's hard to track down, you don't have information rights. So it's kind of like getting all that in order because anyone else who runs a real, like an LP, like a real endowment or fund of funds or whatever, I mean, they just can't take that to committee. Like it just wouldn't pass their operational DD. And then I think it's like, what's what are the proof points? And so, and I, I do also want to make a comment on differentiation when we get around to it. But like you could talk about differentiation on X, Y, or Z access. It's like, what is in the portfolio? Who have you co-invested with? Who's followed on? How much money is followed on? Do I recognize any of the companies? And so like, you almost have to reverse engineer that three to five years from day one. And that's super hard to do. Um, I, I don't know how you, it, it, so much luck is involved in that. Um, and, and what you've described here um, in many ways is drawing the distinction between investing capital in a, in a pool of capital and actually running a business. And, you know, for a lot of people, I think it would be really instructive, and maybe, Sean, you can uh, provide your, your input on this, is you, your new fund is, has a target of, I think, 100, $125 million. With that, you've become institutional. What were the major milestones that you looked at internally as you became institutional? Um, and walk us through, if you were giving advice to the folks out here that are looking to go down that path, what did you learn? Yeah, I think, well, we started off wanting to be institutional and certainly was not easy. Our first fund was uh, about $40 million. And we set out to raise more. I mean, that was my, maybe mistake number one. Uh, now, it was 2008, it was going well until it was not going well at all, uh, so that was a challenge. But I think we probably should have targeted as a smaller fund size. We could show more momentum in that process than we could. Um, but given what happened in the fall of that year, we're lucky, I think, to have any fund at all. So that was our intent, was to be institutional. And there are elements to be institutional grade that are administrative, like having an audit, quarterly results, and LP communications, and a back office, and all those kinds of things. Uh, but you also need to make sure that LPs understand, again, differentiation and your brand, and you'll get a ton of questions, as I'm sure you already have, as to deal flow. Uh, why are you getting advantage deal flow? Why do you have special access that others may not? Uh, I find, surprisingly, there's very little question about selection, even though we'll have 100 first meetings and invest in about 2%, just under 2% of those companies. No one ever asks about why those two versus the 100 that you looked at. They always ask just about I the top. I actually asked that on the top. Good, I think you should. Um, I always ask, what did you say no to recently? That's, that's a good question. Um, there are exceptions to this, for sure. But in general, we get a lot more discussion on the top of the funnel than things down below. So we certainly learned that you know, along the way. I do think, from a fundraising perspective, uh, there are you know, family offices and then more bigger institutions, endowments, foundations, maybe fund to funds. And there are pros and cons, and I'll try to quickly summarize that. I think for a first-time fund, uh, even second time fun, I think family offices are the way to go. They can typically move more quickly. 
Uh, and typically they're well networked with other family offices. And again, getting back to that momentum, if you can get an early win with a family office, you can use that in those next meetings and use them to say, who do you, who do you co-invest with? This is a wealthy family behind the name, the name. What are the other wealthy people that you've worked with in the past? Help me uh, meet those folks and build momentum that way. Now, the downside I've found to some family offices is even if you do very well over time, and it's a great relationship, they love what you're doing, they often have their quantum of investment. You know, they'll put, say, $5 million into a fund, and regardless of your performance, and they're happy to do it perhaps, but they're going to put $5 million into the next fund. And maybe you're looking to be, as we have, slightly larger over time, uh, and they're not able to grow with you as easily. It's just not their way of doing business in many cases. Uh, where institutions, uh, they're slower to come on board, but once they're on board and you earn the right to have them re-up again, uh, they're often interested in putting a little more to work and can help you grow if you're looking to do that. Well, you know, Margo and I actually have a lot of discussions around the, uh, the venture landscape, merging managers, and oftentimes, you know, we get into discussions around who's coming back to market. And right now, there's a lot of people coming back to market, to fund two, fund three. And sometimes Margo asks me, you know, are they, are they a good investor? And, you know, my honest to God answer is I, I really don't know yet. And so as you think about it, you're an allocator. You're looking at a lot of these funds. What do, you know, what does a manager really have to show from an execution standpoint within that first fund to make it interesting for you? And, you know, Semel and Sean talked about some of these execution milestones, some of the operating things. What's your perspective on that? Yeah, so um, even fund, fund one can come to us in a myriad of forms. So sometimes it is personal capital that was in angel investments. Sometimes it was a true fund one that you put together knowing it was a stepping stone, meaning that it might not have had institutional investors. So when some comes to us with something to evaluate, I think um, we're really looking to there's kind of three ways. One, we're, we're always kind of assessing the people. And first place, and I think this is where family offices probably spend a lot of their time, is figuring out if there's somebody in our network that we've already had a long relationship with, whether it was through how the wealth was generated for the family, whether it was through an existing manager relationship that they have, or whether it is through this kind of social family office network. Um, validating the people and trying to backfill some of the longevity, right? We're signing up for 10 to 15 years with somebody. We want to make sure that we can assess the people. Um, honesty, consistency, do what they say. When we're evaluating the um, portfolio, we are looking for a thesis around their investment strategy. And I think what that helps drive is consistency. So. Uh, any of us, I'm sure, could go out and look at 20 different things every day in terms of a new startup company. And I think it's as important for a fund to be able to identify and clearly state what they don't do as it is for them to state what they will do. And so having that consistency around your strategy and then having every other piece that I'm going to dig in on and you're going to present to me reinforce it. So how are you sourcing the deals, the top of that funnel? You know, where is your stuff coming from? Why are, why are people calling you? Then I want to dig into the engine of your organization. How does it get from something across your doorstep to actually a decision that you make? What are the things that you're looking for? You have to show me the process that you go through. And I recently was meeting with a manager, and, and I really firmly believe in their thesis and I actually look at their portfolio, they're coming to me for fun too. Their portfolio is actually filled with companies that I've seen in other portfolios of ours or I've seen through our own diligence work and, and they're good companies. But they didn't really articulate yet for me that engine, how it got from across their doorstep on the thesis to actually their position in the company. And so thankful for them, I, I'm intrigued enough that I'm gonna go back and dig in more. But that's a place where it can really break down. And, and the other place for newer funds that it comes through is what I typically will give advice on, which is think about your portfolio construction. So if you come to me and you show me your angel investments where because of your network and your friendships, you got into deals and you can maybe tell me why it was an interesting space and so you were enthusiastic about it. But at the end of the day, the dollar check that you wrote 
wasn't going to make or break for you. It wasn't necessarily maybe even part of a strategy because maybe at that point you were still living your other world before you decided to become a venture capitalist. Now that you're going to have a fund, you have to think about how that check is structured from a size standpoint, from an ownership standpoint, how you're going to reinforce your position in that company, both in the value you're going to convince the rest of the cap table and the, and the management team that you bring, as well as um, the value you'll be recognized for in those subsequent rounds that you can continue to add on to your position. So, um, you know, we're looking at the people, we're looking at the portfolio, but the real engine behind how it got there. Um, and um, I'm blanking on what my third was, but I think I gave enough in there. <laughs> yeah, no, that was, uh, that, was, that was helpful. And I, it's actually a very good segue into what's really important, fundraising. To, to actually deploy a fund, you need capital. And, and I'm going to maybe turn it to the two GPs and then Margot afterwards. And, and I'm going to just for a second pretend that, that you are raising your first fund right now. I know the uh, topic here is designing and raising your first $30 million fund. Forget about $30 million, just say first fund. You have been through, you know, I would say some battles as it related to fundraising. Fundraising at very difficult times fundraising without a track record. If you were starting right now, what are the things that you would do in launching the fund, and what are the things you wouldn't do, given what you know about LPs? Yeah, I don't know if we have enough time to say what I wouldn't do, so I think I'll just focus on like very tactical things for the, for the group um, that I think m might be useful. So, um, and, and you can kind of pick and choose from these, or like pick two of the three or four. Um, I would say number one is go find a capital partner before you start to try to raise. And that's a, it's a bit of a mindset, mindset shift, but I think it's important. Um, so, so that'd be number one. If that doesn't work, I would try to raise a smaller fund or become a scout for a larger fund. And what you're doing there is like other people in the ecosystem or people from your network who know you can kind of subsidize your ability to build a track record. Once you figure that out, and by the way, there's so many funds running scout programs. There's so many entrepreneurs that are starting these small funds, sorry, sorry, backing these small funds, that if you're here in the Bay Area and you can't do that, then something else is wrong. Um, and so I would, you know, I, would, I would take a step back at that point. Once you do get access to make a track record, I would think about shots on goal and what you're optimizing for. You're, if you get a million dollars fund or a million dollar scout allocation and you 10x that, you're, you're not gonna make life-changing money. So it's really about um, how do you get associated with companies and tell a story around each of those companies. Um, obviously, they're all not gonna work out and so a lot of luck is involved. I would say three, um, there are new programs available. Um, I think AngelList has spearhead um, first round runs some program, YC runs some program. Every single fund on Sand Hill Road has a scout program, whether they admit it or not. Um, and so there's lots of ways to build up that track record. There are entrepreneurs who have made hundreds of millions of dollars that are starting family offices here that they haven't even deployed their money yet. Um, so they're, they're just, even in the five years that I've been investing, like the landscape has completely changed. But that would be my three pieces of advice. Find a capital partner, do a small fund or a scout fund, and then three, think about your shots on goal. Because if you're not in companies that people don't recognize, like, you're toast. Yeah, that's super, super helpful advice, I think. I, maybe I'll talk, if that was more tactical and super useful, let me, let me just say, um, one thing to think about, and I have some friends and, and former colleagues who are, you know, have thought about or are starting their own funds, and so we end up talking about this a lot, and that is, do you really want to do this or not? In the sense that it's one thing to have a seed fund, which you have ultimate flexibility. You're able to dial it down, you know, up or down as you see fit. You might even decide to join one of the companies you've backed because you find it to be so promising. So, and that's kind of a career choice. Do I want that kind of flexibility? Uh, or do I really want to be a venture in the venture business for a career, hopefully? 
And that's just a different kind of mindset and attitude because you are now making a commitment to your investors that you'll do this for 10 years or often 12 years these days uh, with every fund. And so are you, is that what you want to do? Do you really want to commit yourself to managing that portfolio over a very, very long period of time? And, and some people, that's what they want to do. That was our mindset. But I think some folks say, well, I don't really want to do that necessarily. I just want to have a little more capital to kind of con continue doing what I'm doing. So that's maybe an obvious point, but I think one that uh, deserves some attention. Then I think, um, you know, when it comes to fund size, I think one thing I found, again, coming out of these conversations, uh, is that you ask the question, what is your minimum fund size? I know you have a target that you think is right for your strategy. What's the minimum amount you think you really need to both, A, make that strategy work, and B, it's enough for you to make a living, and whoever you're going to be hiring and all the costs you have associated with having you know, a real fund, like an institutional fund, and often I find they haven't really thought about that minimum amount. And you want to make sure you understand what that is and don't close on any capital before then, ideally. So really make sure it's going to be worth your while and your investor's while and get past that target. And it's not something you necessarily share with prospective investors if you don't want to, but it's something that internally you should certainly understand uh, as you think about whether it's, it's worth pursuing and for how long you'll be you know, attempting to pursue it if it's, if it's taking a while. I'm going to actually, we're, we have about five minutes left. I'm going to uh, open it up to questions in one second. Before I do that, one last question for Margo. You know, as we see things, you know, progress, we, we're 10 years into an economic recovery. You mentioned it earlier. There's a lot of capital flowing into the private markets. Assets are continue to increase in price. Um, and we have a lot of new managers. I've said this this year, and it, it you know, in some ways, it, you know, I want to balance it. I, I do feel like we're in the greatest time for being a tech investor, greatest time of starting a company. We think we're at the early stages of a tech revolution. However, the capital markets, you know, in some way have to slow down, um, or at least you think they would. What's your reaction to the statement that the next couple years for first time managers are gonna be as tough as any other period we've ever seen? I think it's probably still correct but part of that is because I'm not sure it's ever easy for first-time managers. You're always having to establish yourself out there. Um, so while there's a ton of capital, if we get any of the expected pullback in the public market, continued real um, ascension of the interest rates, it's going to affect these pools of capital that are you know, right now kind of pointed and at least interested in venture capital and then early stage, uh, sorry, first time uh, capital, first time venture funds. So I do worry that a hiccup is going to have a more severe pullback, uh, at least initially, similar to what we saw after the global financial crisis. So people should be prepared for that. Um, and if you've made the decision to go raise a fund, I would make sure that you feel that pressure kind of every day to, to get it going. Um, the counterpoint, however, is that there is a ton of capital. So um, capital is gonna be affected in different markets differently and there's pockets coming from overseas that might be sitting in cash already and not feel any effects of uh, the public market or the interest rates and that sort of thing. So you might need to change your tactic of how you raise money, but capital might be available. Well, and, and that's, I think, a very good point. I mean, venture capital as a asset category raises about, right now, about 35 to $40 billion a year. Within that, micro VC, sub $100 million funds are about, the last five years, four to six billion. So we're talking about a very small, so even if there's a pullback, you'd expect to be, still to have a lot of capital to deploy by uh, institutionals and per perhaps non-institutionals. Um, I'm gonna take one or two questions. Any, any questions out there? I have it figured out. You all got it? <laughs> Easy, right? Um, so if there's no questions, one lasting, maybe parting comment from each of you. Well, I don't know why this popped into my mind, but I, I, this maybe came out of some recent conversations, but I, I find, and we certainly made this mistake ourselves, uh, and that is when you're thinking about fundraising, kind of over-optimizing 
who you think will be interested and spending too much time engineering that when it's really difficult, we have found, to know in advance who's going to have interest in what you're doing and who's not. Even after the first meeting, we've had meetings where I thought, oh, this is fantastic, they love it, they want to do early stage venture, and I never hear from them again. Or we have a terrible meeting, I think, oh my god, they didn't get it at all, they're over allocated a venture, this is going nowhere, and the next thing you know, they want to invest. Uh, so that's after the meeting, so you really don't know where, you know, what, there, are, there are issues that they're dealing with internally you may never fully appreciate or understand, and so I have a lot of appreciation for, Jeep, for, for our founders raising capital. Uh, but don't overthink it, over-engineer it, just get in front of as many people as you can, talk about some of the things we talk about, what's the engine, what's the machine they're investing in, uh, and you often be surprised about who has interest. And actually before we get in, I, I do have a question here that I actually think is a really good one. We touched on this, um, I think Margo, you touched on it in Semel as well, differentiation. So if you think about the product of a venture capital firm, you know, there's, if, you know, historically that was capital, right? You can deploy capital, that's your product. More and more, um, the way I look at it at least, is the product is really not just the capital, it's non-differentiated. What is your actual product and how do you differentiate that? Um, so the best line I ever heard, a friend of mine who was in venture for a while, <clears throat> said that the product of a VC firm is to make decisions. And I, it, I totally believe that that is a product. Um, everything else around it supports the decision, uh, but it's really how do you get people and networks in a room to make decisions around those peoples and networks. Um, in terms of differentiation, my comment would be that it's a word that's often used, and then it gets to this point, like a game of telephone, where people start using it and they forgot what it's supposed to mean. And so a, f a group of fund managers in a partnership can be differentiated by who they are, or they can be all norm core and have a differentiated strategy, or um, their, their, their service offering can be differentiated, or you, know, you, can, you can pick what it is. But ultimately, at the end of the day, are you in good companies or not, right? And so I think you can look at some firms, and, and this is where I think the argumentation breaks down, where they're, they're not very differentiated, or maybe there's just a star GP at the fund, and they're in some random companies, and they keep hitting companies per fund. It might just be that their network and selection is good. So I think that, People can over tilt on differentiation. Um, and so in some cases it's probably important, in some cases it's probably just marketing. Why don't, why don't we do this? Um, we have about 60 seconds of getting the, uh, the, uh, the hook here. Um, do either of you, Margo, Sean, have an answer to that question around differentiation or one or two parting thoughts? For me, differentiation comes through. At the end of the day, I'm an investor and I care about returns. And so I'm looking for you to be able to um, find interesting places to put my money for a little bit of time, be aligned with me with respect to how you charge me for that expertise, so that, and pick good areas that at the end of the day has to sell their product or service. And so we do take a kind of a, a customer sales approach to things um, when we're evaluating things. I have a parting thought. I thought you already had. Oh, you did. Uh, two. No, that was on differentiation. Okay, good. So I would say that, um, yeah, one parting thought is I, I try to help a lot of new managers come in and very active in helping people raise funds or, or give feedback on decks. I'm, I'm sure Sean is as well. Um, one thing I hear quite often is, hey, I need to raise a fund of X because yada, 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 like I need a salary. And my, my comment back always is, you're not owed that salary. And so I think people have to step back when they're trying to raise a fund and think, okay, how can I do it? How can I get my scorecard? How can I get my rap sheet in, in other creative ways if that fund isn't coming? Because there are ways now that are there. That's great. Well, let's thank our panelists for being up here and sharing their thoughts. <laughs>